Look with me in Matthew chapter 21, if you would, and I want to talk with you about enduring love for lost souls. Matthew 21, going to begin reading in verse 23. Matthew 21, beginning in verse 23. The Bible says, Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. Who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, John's ministry, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he didn't go. Which of the two did his father's will? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you still did not repent and believe. We're going to be talking uh, about Matthew chapter 22 this morning. In that chapter, the chief priests, the elders, the Pharisees, they all got in line to come examine Jesus, to question him. And we won't take the time to read all the verses. I hope you'll read them uh, maybe later on, but I'm going to be talking about them today. We're going to talk about enduring love for lost souls. Let's just give thanks to the Lord. Father, thank you for this morning, for the people you love so much, and for your presence with us. Father, I pray we would encounter you today as we receive your word. If your heart agrees, would you say amen, amen. and amen. So if you had only one week left to live, how would you spend it? Where would you go? What would you do? Who would you be sure to see? What matters would you try to set right with people? What would you try to settle? What final words would you say to those you love? Who would you try to lead to Christ? What final prayers would you lift to God before you slip into eternity and see his face? During this season of Lent, we're walking with Jesus through the consecutive days of the Passion Week. It would be perfectly right to say that Jesus' life is the most important life that was ever lived. All life comes from him, and eternal life depends entirely upon him. Our eternal destiny hung on the success of his earthly mission. His life was the most important ever lived, and the last week of his life was the most important of his life. You know, one of the, the way the Bible communicates what's important is the amount of space it devotes to a topic. The, the more that's written, the more important it is. There's more written in the Gospels about the Passion Week than any other week of Jesus' life. 30% of the Gospel of Matthew is devoted to the Passion Week. 40% of Mark. 20% of Luke, 30% of John. So during this season of Lent, we are studying the most important week of the most important life ever lived. And it's full of lessons for us. You see, how Jesus spent his last week shows us how we ought to spend every week. Amen. Jesus shows us what we should prioritize, what we should expend energy and effort on, and what we should just leave in the hands of God. Pastor Nick shared with us about the first day of Passion Week, Palm Sunday. Last week we talked about Holy Monday. Let's talk today about Holy Tuesday. During most of Passion Week, 
Jesus slept each night in the suburb of Bethany, about a mile and a half outside of the city. So on Tuesday morning, Jesus and the disciples are, are again walking into Jerusalem from Bethany and they pass by that fig tree that Jesus cursed and they see it was withered. If you missed last week, we'll explain to you why Jesus did that. He wasn't just being mean to the tree. It had, it had a purpose. Jesus went into the temple and he began sparring with the Jewish religious leaders. That's what we're going to talk about today. After that was over, Jesus went out on the Mount of Olives, and from that point forward, he only ministered to the disciples. He, he told them about the destruction of Jerusalem and about things to come. Something interesting about Holy Tuesday, it is regarded as the longest day of Jesus' entire life. More scripture is written about Holy Tuesday than any other single day in Jesus' life, even more than Good Friday. And how did Jesus spend the longest day of his life? He spent it contending for souls. He spent it evangelizing. He spent it witnessing. Uh, on Holy Tuesday, Jesus told the disciples, He who endures to the end shall be saved. What a beautiful picture we have of Jesus on Holy Tuesday. Oh, on, on his third to last day on earth, Jesus is enduring all day and all night for lost souls. In the temple, he endures some insincere questions. In the temple, he patiently endures the, the efforts of the Jewish leaders to discredit him and, and trick him into incriminating himself. No wonder the Bible says, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Just 72 hours before his horrific death on the cross, beautiful Jesus is contending to save the souls of the very ones who will condemn him to death. 72 hours before they hand him over. He, he, 72 hours before they, they pay the rabble rousers to start the chant, crucify him. 72 hours before they mock him and beat him and flay him with whips. Beautiful Jesus is using everything he has to reason and to plead with and to persuade his very accusers to believe on him. He's using all his intelligence, all his divine wisdom, all of the knowledge of scriptures he has, all the spiritual gifts he has, all the fruit that he has, everything he has, Jesus is using to try to win them. As we think about our days, let's be like Jesus. Let's endure in love for lost souls, all the abilities God has given us, all the gifts God has given us, both natural and supernatural, all, all the biblical knowledge we have, all the practical knowledge we've accumulated, let's use everything we have to persuade people to believe on Jesus. Looking at Holy Tuesday, I see four ways that we can endure in love for the lost and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Enduring in love for the lost. Four ways from Holy Tuesday. First of all, endure Annas and his henchmen. Endure Annas and his henchmen. Early in the morning of Holy Tuesday, Jesus and the disciples arrive in the temple. And they are met immediately by the chief priests and the elders. The chief priest was a man named Annas. He was the, the chief priest emeritus. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, was the acting high priest, and there was a group of priests with them. The elders were not priests. They were the heads of the leading families in Jerusalem. They were the heads of the Rockefeller and Kennedy and Vanderbilt families. So this was a group of Pastors and lay deacons, this was the executive board of the Jewish faith, if you will. 
So far, Passion Week had been pretty eventful. On Sunday, Jesus rode into town on a donkey with throngs of people worshiping him as Messiah. On Monday, he threw the money changers and the animal sellers out of the temple. He healed the blind and the lame, and he taught and received praises. Jesus caught the board off guard on Monday and Tuesday. They weren't expecting, uh, on Sunday and Monday, they weren't expecting him, but on Tuesday, they were ready for him. They demanded to know, by what authority are you doing these things? Jesus, who gave you authority to ride in here on your donkey and cleanse the temple and heal the sick and accept praises? Jesus immediately recognized the heart of the issue. The reason that they didn't receive his authority is because they weren't submitted to God's authority. Whoever refuses the Son doesn't have the Father. Last week we talked about insurrectionists in God's house. On Holy Monday, Jesus said, you have made my house a hideout for not thieves or robbers. You have made my house a hideout for the word is insurrectionists, rebels against authority. Here's the irony of Holy Monday. Jesus was arrested as an insurrectionist. He was tried as an insurrectionist. His life was traded for the life of a convicted insurrectionist named Barabbas. He was crucified as an insurrectionist between two, not thieves, but the word is insurrectionists. But the irony of Holy Monday is that the real insurrectionists were there hiding out in God's house. Hiding out beneath all the religious trappings of God's house were people whose hearts were not submitted to the Father. 2,000 years later, I find that both within God's house and outside of God's house, there are still plenty of insurrectionists. Indeed, the Bible says we are all born insurrectionists. Because of the sin of our father Adam, all of us are born into rebellion against God. All of us are born with hearts inclined to disobey Him. All of us are born with a desire to be independent from Him, to to be the captain of our own ship. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way. 72 hours before Annas and his henchmen hand Jesus over to be crucified, Beautiful Jesus is enduring in love for them. He's contending with the insurrectionists. Now here's how we know Jesus was Jewish. Rather than answering their question directly, Jesus answers them with a counter question. I know my father-in-law is 100% Ukrainian, but I swear he must be Jewish Ukrainian. He loves corned beef, he loves matzo ball soup, he loves kosher dills, and he never gives a straight answer to a question. (laughs) He always answers a question with another question. And that's just like Jesus. Jesus said, I'll tell you what, boys. He said, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. Where did John's authority come from? You see, Jesus' question cornered the chief priests and the elders. They couldn't say that John's authority came from God because John preached that Jesus was the Messiah. John preached that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. By the way, on Holy Tuesday, that was the day that the priests were inspecting the Passover lambs for sacrifice and Jesus was in the temple, the Lamb of God being cross-examined by the high priest. Hmm. They rejected John's preaching. If they said that John was from heaven, they'd be admitting that John was right and they were wrong. On the other hand, the crowds loved John. If they they regarded him as a prophet, if, if they said that John's authority was not from God, they'd lose popularity, so they pled the fifth. We can't say. But more than cornering them, Jesus' purpose was to reveal the reason that they didn't accept him. It was because they had been in rebellion to God for a long time. 
They didn't receive Jesus because they refused to believe John. Jesus is contending. I want you to see, he's not just trying to corner them. He's contending for their hearts. Believe John and receive me. So how do we endure Annas and his henchmen? How do we contend for insurrectionists like Jesus did? Well, let's be God's messengers. Let's share God's word and watch his word slowly change people's hearts. Jesus tells three parables. Can't, can't go through Wish I could. Can't go through them all with you today. But, but let's talk about just the first one. In Matthew 21, Jesus says that a father asks his two sons to go into a vineyard. But the first son says, no, I won't. But then he has a change of heart and he goes. The second son says, yeah, dad, I'll go. But then he starts playing a video game, Minecraft. And he forgets all about it. The father in the parable represents John the Baptist. The first crowd are the swindlers and the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes that first went into the wilderness to listen to John. That they didn't receive his preaching at first, but but later they had a change of heart and they were baptized. The second son represents the chief priests and the elders who came from Jerusalem to hear John later after he was already popular. They they were excited to go hear John, but his message didn't change their hearts. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are rushing into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. What can we learn here from Jesus? Well, first of all, no matter the failures of one's past nor the messes of one's present, the word of God has the power to change people's hearts and minds. The word of God had the power to change the hearts of swindlers and sinners and the word of God still has power today. But but I want you to notice with me, second, that it didn't change them right away. At first they said no, and they walked away. But the word worked in their hearts for a while. And after a little bit, they came running back, Jesus said, right into the kingdom of God. You know, we have pretty much a walkout every weekend that we have services. In fact, it's gotten to the point, it's a spiritual thing, it's gotten to the point if somebody doesn't walk out, I figure I'm not preaching very good that day. It's a spiritual thing. But, but I, I have to tell you, one, one of my joys as a pastor is to see people who said no at first and then to see them come in and come running into the arms of Jesus. It's all in the body language. See, you don't think I see, but I see. By the way, if you're going to drink a coffee, don't sneak it. Just drink your coffee, all right? I see you back there. I, I see you back there, all right, like hunching down, trying to, trying to drink. You're going to spill it all down your shirt, all right? Just drink the coffee, okay? Because I, I see you, okay? I see, I see it all, all right? You think I don't see, but I see. <laughs> they come in, and at first they sit like this with their arms folded and a scowl on their face. But then the word of God works a little while. The the word of God, it works. That They say no at first, but the word of God, it works in their heart. And then then I see them one Sunday like this. It's just like this. Their hand right up. And and they close their eyes just for a second. And then, you know, they, they open it back up again. And then a little while, I see them like this. And they're starting to open up. The word of God's working. The word of God's working. The word of God's working. And finally, one day, I see them like this. And they're running into the kingdom of God. Listen, if if you have an insurrectionist in your life, someone who refuses to accept Jesus, just keep witnessing the word to them. You be their voice in the wilderness. Keep pointing them to the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Keep imploring them to turn to God and to receive his washing. How do we endure in love for the lost? Four ways I see from Holy Tuesday. Endure Annas and his henchmen. Secondly, endure antagonists. Endure antagonists. 
Beloved, listen to me. Few things on earth, few powers, few forces on earth have the ability to galvanize people who are enemies like the power of hatred. Seeing that Jesus had bested the chief priests and the elders, the Pharisees and the Herodians teamed up. And they came to have another go at Jesus. Now, under normal circumstances, these two groups are arch, arch rivals. The Pharisees were ultra conservative. They were nationalistic. They were deeply religious. The Herodians were ultra liberal, that they were secular Jews, that they supported Roman occupation. That this would be like teaming up a far, far right conservative Republican and a, and a far, far left uh, liberal Democrat and asking the two of them to work together. These two groups despised each other but not as much as they despised Jesus. They came with insincere flattery to pose an insincere question. Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You teach the truth of God without, literally what it says in Greek is, without flinching at people's faces. Tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They thought they had laid the perfect trap for Jesus. The Jewish crowd hated paying taxes. And who doesn't? Between the Roman taxes and the Jewish taxes, the estimated effective tax rate for the average family was 50%. They were living in Canada for crying out loud. Nationalistic Jews considered Roman taxes a slap in the face. They considered it an embarrassment to God. How could God's own people be under the thumb of Rome? If Jesus said, yes, pay your taxes, immediately he would lose popularity. On the other hand, Jesus, if Jesus said, don't pay your taxes, they would have caught him red-handed in an act of insurrection against Rome. Yes. Beloved, can I tell you, this might come as a, wait, this might come as a shock. Brace yourself for it. You ready? As we follow Jesus, sometimes we encounter antagonists. Once they find out we're Christians, people who would otherwise be enemies, rivals, that the, they join forces to tag team us. Now, I know that shocks you. I know you've never had that happen, but it, it might happen. People who don't get along in the office, they will gang up on us. People who intensely dislike each other will come together because they dislike Jesus in us even more. And they come at us with insincere questions. They're not really looking sincerely for an answer. They're just looking for an opportunity to discredit us. They come with trick questions designed to force us into either alienating half the people over here or half the people over there. Yeah. They come at us with questions on hot-button issues, and they don't really want an answer. They just want to stir up strife. Yeah. They come at us with yes or no questions that, that have no good answer. Tell me, have you stopped shoplifting? Well, if I say yes, it means I was. If I say no, it means I'm still shoplifting. There's no way to answer it. So, so, so what do we do with that? How can we endure in love for our antagonists? How, how can we contend with them? How, how can we give them sincere answers to insincere questions? Well, Jesus avoided the trap by redirecting the conversation, and we can too. Let's redirect the conversation to Jesus who is the truth. Ironically, the Pharisees and the Herodians, the, their flattery was absolutely spot on about Jesus. Jesus truly was a man of integrity who taught God's truth without flinching at people's faces. They thought that Jesus was just like them. There's a verse in the Bible, God says, Psh, y'all thought I was one like you. Wrong. That they were good politicians. They would change their story depending on what audience they were standing in front of. But not Jesus. Jesus is the truth who never changes. 
Beloved, listen to me. The truth of God is always true in every generation, in every culture, in every age, in every era. Until the end of this age, God's truth is always true. One of my favorite Christian spokesmen is Franklin Graham. No matter what he is asked, Franklin Graham always redirects the conversation to Jesus. God did the most loving thing he could ever do. He sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross so that whoever believes on him will have eternal life. Franklin Graham's answer to any and every question is John 3.16. And beloved, listen, no matter what the antagonists ask you, take the conversation straight to Jesus. Tell them Jesus is God's son. Tell them he came to earth and he walked among us as a man. Tell them that he laid down his life on the cross and shed his blood and he rose again on the third day. Tell them that there is forgiveness and freedom and a new life through faith in his name. Redirect the conversation to Jesus and let's redirect the conversation to surrendering to God. Jesus asked to borrow a Roman coin. Just as a side note, Jesus never carried any money on him. He didn't have to. Jesus had the authority from the Father to requisition whatever he needed for the ministry whenever he needed it. Can I tell you, God has given us that same authority too. We just have to learn how to walk in that. On the coin, that's a a freebie. That's a side note for you, all right? That's That's a little aside. On the coin was an image of Caesar. In Latin, it said Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. On the back, it said in Latin, high priest. Now, everywhere in the world, it was regarded that a coin belonged to whomever's image and name was on it. And so all the coins with Caesar's picture belonged to Caesar. If you happen to have a few jangling around in your pocket, he was just graciously letting you hold on to them. Although the Jewish people hated paying taxes, the rabbis had taught for a long time that that taxes ought to be paid even to occupying powers because ultimately it is God who puts, listen to me, every king in place. Listen to this. Listen. God puts even kings who think they are gods in place for a little while for his own purposes. Think about that. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to Caesar what has Caesar's image and name on it. But Jesus doesn't care about coin. He went on to say, and give to God what is God's. Give to God what has his image stamped upon it. Give to God what has his name written on it. And what is that? That's you and that's me. We are the ones who are made in his image and his very name is inscribed upon us. Glenn Harvison, child of God. Lila, child of God. Tom, child of God. Rosie, child of God. Erica, child of God. Just like all the coins with Caesar's image belong to Caesar, so all the people of the earth made in God's image belong to God. He has the right of ownership over us. We're valuable simply because we bear his image. The light of human conscience and conscience the ability to emote, the ability to express ourselves, the ability to write a sermon, the ability to decide for ourselves, the the ability to create, it's his image stamped on us. And we all belong to him. He can recall us anytime he wants. Jesus said, listen, listen, somebody hear a word from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, offer yourself back to him. Put yourself in his hands. Give yourself to him. While I was praying last night, the, the Holy Spirit quickened my heart. I knew, I knew in one of these three services this morning, there's going to be someone, and God's speaking to you. I think it's this service. I really do. God's speaking to you. Give yourself back to him. 
Maybe you've been away from him for a little while. I believe today is the day. Give yourself back to him. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And give to God what is God. You belong to God. Made in his image. Put yourself in his hands today. Enduring love for the lost. Four ways from Holy Tuesday. Endure Annas. Endure antagonist. And third, endure agnostics. Now Jesus had bested the chief priests and the elders. He had bested the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now the Sadducees came. They, they were lined up to come at Jesus. And they came with a, a tried and true trick question about the afterlife. It was based on the law of Moses. If a man married but he died before he and his wife could have children, if he had a brother, the brother was obligated to, to marry his wife and to produce children in the deceased brother's name. I hope you like your sister-in-law. <laughs> the Sadducees came with a ridiculous hypothetical question about a widow who was married to seven brothers. It was a, listen, listen, listen. It was a question from the hypothetical extreme. It, it was easy to see right through the Sadducees. First of all, beloved, listen to this. Hypothetical extremes are always insincere questions. And in the public arena today, in the forum today, that all the questions that, that are posed are, are in the form of hypothetical extremes. But, but they're not designed to seek information. They're designed to trip up an opponent. But even more obvious, the Sadducees didn't believe in heaven. The Sadducees were like the Manhattanites of Jerusalem. Like the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side. They were affluent. They were erudite, they were liberal, they were secular, they were cavalier, they were also supernatural skeptics. The Sadducees believed in God, but they didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in miracles, they didn't believe in divine encounters. That's why they were so sad, you see. Sorry, it's an old joke, it's a very old joke. Out of respect, I attended a, a funeral a while ago. The deceased person uh, had a lot of truly noble accomplishments in their life. And, and the officiant at the funeral said, if there was any place to go, this person certainly would deserve to go there. And I wondered, how could anybody cling to such a hopeless religion? Beloved, I have to tell you the truth. If there was, I love you all, but if there was not the hope of heaven at harvest time, I would be out of here. How can we endure agnostics? How can we contend for them like Jesus did? Well, let's inspire them with the truth about the eternal God. The, the major Old Testament scriptures that talk about the resurrection are in the books of Job and Isaiah and Daniel, later Old Testament books. The Sadducees only recognized the books of Moses. And they didn't think that the resurrection was in the books of Moses, but they were wrong. Jesus answered them from Exodus. And he said, hey guys... When God appeared to Moses, God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. He said, I am the God of Abraham. Meaning Abraham, although he died centuries ago, is still alive. God made an eternal covenant with Abraham. And he makes an eternal covenant with you and me. A covenant so powerful that it transcends death. After we die... God has the power to raise us up again, for he is the God of the living and not the dead. How can we contend with the agnostics? Let's inspire them that, that there's an eternal God who makes an eternal covenant. And let's inspire them with the truth about eternal life. The other mistake of the Sadducees was that they assumed that life in heaven, if it existed, that they assumed that it would be just like life on earth. Jesus said, you don't know. So many people, I, I just, I felt Vinny when I said that. I, I channeled Vinny Scarisi when I said, you don't know. <laughs> Some people today, they're just like the Sadducees. 
when they envision heaven, they, they think of it as some kind of extension of life here on earth, but the Bible says it is so much better. Yeah. Our resurrection bodies, they are not like these earthly bodies that get old and out of shape and sick and wear out. They are spiritual bodies. Fish can't survive on land. They're made for the water. Humans can't survive in outer space. We're made for the atmosphere of earth. Likewise, these earthly bodies cannot survive in heaven. They're not made for heaven's atmosphere. So we will be transformed. And our resurrection relationships are not like earthly relationships either. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus says, your question is silly. There is no marriage in heaven. Will we recognize each other in heaven? Yes, we will. Will we love each other less in heaven? No, we won't. We'll love each other differently, but we will all love each other more. But most of all, we'll be in love with Jesus, the one who promised to go ahead of us and prepare a place for us and to come back for us and to take us by the hand and to lead us there when our journey here on earth is through. Enduring love for the lost, four ways from Holy Tuesday. Endure Annas and his henchmen. Endure the antagonists. Endure the agnostics. And finally, endure until astonishment becomes all in. Endure until astonishment becomes all in. Beloved, it is true that hate galvanizes enemies, but it is also true that love galvanizes believers even more. Amen. Matthew says the crowds were astonished at Jesus' teaching. Among them, Mark says, was a young scholar who, who was deeply moved by Jesus. He came to Jesus not with a trick question, but with a sincere question. He said, teacher, what is the greatest commandment of all? Beloved, listen to me. Listen, 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 listen. If we will be patient with the insurrectionists, if we'll be patient with the antagonists, if we'll be patient with the agnostics, if we'll be patient with their insincere questions, if we will answer them skillfully and sincerely, eventually it will begin producing sincere questions. He wasn't coming to trick Jesus like all the others. He had a true question. Master, what is the greatest commandment of all? Apparently the rabbis were on a quest, an endless quest, to find one axiom that could sum up the whole Jewish faith. The Jews had 613 laws, 248 thou shalt's, and 365 thou shalt nots. There was one thou shalt not for every day of the year. And how do you distill 613 laws down into to one pithy axiom? You know, the whole thing started when a Gentile challenged Judaism's most famous rabbi one day. Well, Judaism's most fam famous rabbi is Jesus. But after him, there was a guy called Hillel. And one day a Gentile challenged Hillel. He said, I'll convert to Judaism if you can recite the entire law standing on one foot. Hillel said, challenge accepted. And he raised one foot and he said an axiom that's similar to the golden rule. He said, what you yourself hate, do not do to the others. All the rest is commentary. And the man had to convert to Judaism. But apparently... Hillel's answer didn't satisfy everyone because from that moment forward, the rabbis racked their brains trying to find one axiom that covered it all. Jesus answered this sincere young scholar with the words of the Shema, the most common Jewish prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That means love him with your everything. Now listen, the Jewish people said the Shema every morning and every evening. 
The Shema was rolled up on little pieces of paper and it was stuffed into the mezuzahs that were hung on the doorposts of their house. The Shema was rolled up and put inside the leather phylacteries that they, they tied to their wrists or their foreheads when they prayed. The Shema was the opening prayer of every synagogue service. It was the Jewish creed. The rabbis were racking their brains and the answer was right in front of their eyes the whole time. And then Jesus did something no one had ever done before. To the Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4, he linked the command of Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. It's so simple. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. The young scholar said, good answer, Master. To love God and to love others is more important than our entire religion. And Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom. Beloved, listen, the young scholar, he was on the way but he wasn't quite there yet. He was close, but he wasn't in. You see, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. I don't even know what that means, but it means that close is not good enough. It, it means when it comes to heaven, miss it by an inch or a foot or by a mile. If you miss it, you miss it all for all time. Astonishment is a good starting place, but it's only good for so long. We have to come to the place where we're all in. Astonishment is a good beginning, but but love for God and love for others, it is bigger than the sum total of our whole religion. Matthew 22 is the end of Jesus' public ministry. After Matthew 22, Jesus never speaks publicly again, only to the disciples. But just before, listen, 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 don't miss this. I know I'm a little long, but, but, but stay with me. Just before Jesus leaves the temple, he has one last encounter that, that shows his loving, enduring heart. Now listen, at this point, Jesus has bested them all. He bested the chief priests and the elders. He bested the Pharisees. He bested the Herodians. He bested the Sadducees. He bested the scholars. Jesus had clear won the day. But this last encounter shows us that Jesus wasn't there to win arguments. He was there to win hearts. So he posed one last question. It was a counter question. He said, I answered your all questions. Your questions answer me this. Whose son is the Messiah? Now that one was easy peasy. They, they said, of course, he's the son of David, but not so fast. Jesus quoted from Psalm 110, a psalm of David that looks forward to the Messiah. In that psalm, David calls the Messiah, my Lord. So Jesus asked them, how can the Messiah be both David's son and David's Lord? The only way that was possible is if the Messiah was more than just a man. He would have to be both divine and human. And that's exactly who Jesus was and who Jesus is. He is the one and only perfect God, man, sent from heaven to lay down his life for us. Hate galvanized the nationalists and the antagonists and the agnostics against Jesus, but love galvanized all those who were who were astonished by him and turned them into disciples who were all in. Whose son was a Messiah? A rabbi named Nicodemus would answer that question. An elder named Joseph of Arimathea would answer that question. Large numbers of priests in the book of Acts came to answer that question because Jesus spent a day in the temple contending for their souls. A young student named Saul would preach around the world from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, to Rome, and all the way to Lisbon that Jesus is the Son of God and he is the son of David. How did Jesus spend his longest day? Believe me, it was even a little longer than this sermon. How did Jesus spend his longest day? He spent it contending for souls. 
let's be like Jesus. Would you stand on your feet and give him a big praise? In this place?